Well, I will be talking uh, almost exclusively about herpes simplex virus type 1, the so-called cold sore virus, because um, uh, it's really, there's so much more evidence for its role than there is um, for other viruses. There is a fair amount of evidence for certain bacteria, and I would have liked to talk about those, but there simply isn't time in the short time available in the debate. So it will be on the cold sore virus, HSV1, as a to abbreviate it, to make it easier to say. Well, we have very good evidence uh, from, uh, we discovered, we were the first people to discover HSV1 DNA in brain using PCR. And that was the first discovery, unambiguously or definitively, of an infectious agent in human brain. Uh, so uh, there had been experiments before, but they really weren't conclusive. And that was the first PCR study. And what we discovered that in elderly, elderly human brains, both Alzheimer's disease and elderly normals, we found HSV1 DNA, which was very exciting and very surprising. We'd rather hope to find it in Alzheimer's and not in normals, but things don't work out that way very often. Um, and to cut a very long story short, we, um, we found a few years later that the virus when in brain of people who carry the gene for apolipoprotein E, the type 4 allele, which is a known susceptibility factor, it was discovered at that about that time in the 1990s, because I'm talking about 1990s, uh, 30 years ago. Um, we discovered that it, the virus is a, confers a high risk of the disease in people who carry a type 4 allele of the APOE gene. Um, and that, that may accounted for the difference really between the two groups, elderly, normal, and Alzheimer patients, because um, it's, it's actually quite um, common, uh, almost certainly true of most, if not all infections, that your genes determine how you respond to an infection. And, and a very good example of that is tuberculosis, where um, 10 times more people carry the bacterium which causes it, but only one-tenth of the people who carry uh, the bacterium who are infected with it actually develop TB. So in other words, far more people become infected than are actually affected. And that's an important point because people don't always understand that. But it's true also of cold sores where um, nearly everybody is infected, about 80% at least infected with HSV1, the cold sore virus. But only some 25 or 40, up to 40% probably people actually get cold sores. The others are asymptomatic which makes life awkward because they can be classed wrongly as controls simply because they don't show symptoms. And that has messed up quite a lot of studies, in my opinion, which uh, well, they haven't differentiated. We went on and after that to show that there were quite strong links between the features of Alzheimer's disease brain, um, amyloid plaques and so-called neurofibrillary tangles, which are abnormal, <clears throat> abnormal protein deposits in brain. And we found that if you infect cells in culture with the virus, you get these very things or you get the main components of these features. So that was very exciting. And I should say we had the incredible problems getting this accepted because there was so much hostility to the work. So both getting things published it took maybe several years sometimes, and also getting funding for the work was extremely difficult. Anyway, we then went on to um, uh, really, the, I suppose the next major thing we found was that uh, if you infect cells and you get these particular features, you can treat the cells with an antiviral agent, and that greatly reduces the amount of these features that you get in the cells, in other words, um, abnormal uh, plaques and uh, plaques and, and neurofibrillary tangles. So it looked as if antivirals are quite protective. And we, we actually, uh, actually examined about four or five antivirals, and they all, even though they act by completely different mechanisms, they all showed the same thing, that they protected against the appearance. So we then, at that stage, probably earlier, we suggested that antivirals should be used to treat Alzheimer's to these patients. But despite the fact we tried for over five years to get funding, we had no luck, which was very, very frustrating and, and upsetting. Um, I should add, though, that in the last five years, there have been a lot of people who have entered the field, I'm very, very glad to say. And there is now more acceptance of it. There are about over 400 publications which uh, 
almost all supportive, very supportive of this work. And these publications have used completely different mechanisms for examining um, uh, the effects of HSV-1 or uh, uh, completely different method approach techniques and approaches, but they all are consistent or nearly all in showing uh, com com cons being consistent with what we've said. So that's very gratifying. But nonetheless, the establishment, unfortunately, very influential people in the field don't accept it, which is um, really unfortunate. Uh, but we recently... Um, uh, going, we're, we're just submitting a paper now, which I think is very interesting because it's, it's strongly consistent with what we've actually predicted. Um, and perhaps I could tell you about that very briefly. Um, well, it started off with a study which we did, we and some epidemiologists in, um, did, which showed that uh, varicella zoster virus, which is another herpes virus, which has been implicated in Alzheimer's disease, we found that it had... If you get shingles, which is caused by this virus, you have a very slightly increased risk of getting dementia or Alzheimer's disease. These terms are used interchangeably very often, although not quite accurately, but still it's the best that you can do when you're looking at um, uh, uh, databases. They often don't distinguish. Um, and what, what we did find that was very interesting was the vaccination greatly reduced the risk of Alzheimer's disease, vaccination against shingles. And that was a very exciting finding. Uh, and it tallied with other studies using completely different, type, different types of vaccine, which have also showed uh, what they call an off-target effect, um, things like protection against um, Alzheimer's disease by prevention of a particular disease. So that was very interesting. Anyway, we the, what I've been doing recently is studying in in collaboration with some two Americans who have been looking at a 3D cult cell culture model of brain, which I thought was very, very interesting when they looked at the HSV-1. So we tried what happened with this varicella zoster virus, and what we found was that it didn't, it caused some, but by no means all the features of Alzheimer's disease. So we have suggested that it might act directly by causing Alzheimer's disease features, or it might be indirect, acting perhaps conceivably by causing reactivation of latent HSV1 in brain uh, because of through neuroinflammation. What I forgot to say was that the virus is probably normally latent, but we think the effect, uh, the, the, the way it causes Alzheimer's disease, or this is one major cause, not the cause, but a major cause, is by being reactivated by events such as stress or inflammation or immunosuppression and so on. There are a whole load of um, also head injury. So um, what we're saying is that one possibility was that varicella zoster virus, VZV virus, um, cause, could cause Alzheimer's directly by a similar mechanism, but that seemed to be disproved by our not finding the features displayed in the cell model. Or alternatively, it could be a, acting as a switching on process uh, via neuroinflammation. Infections tend to cause inflammation, and um, that can go to the brain and cause inflammation there. And we're saying inflammation is a known reactivator of HSV1 virus. So what we did was very, very um, speculative, but it actually worked, which was delightful. Things rarely work when they're speculative. We got some HSV1 infected cells, which we made semi-latent, so quiescent. They had characteristic features of latency. And we infected those with varicella zoster, VZV. And what we found, very, very surprisingly, that it then started displaying all the features of a uh, uh, normal HSV1 infection, uh, Alzheimer-like features like production of um, uh, material that causes amyloid and the material that causes neurofibrillary tangles, so plaques and amyloid. So it looked as if the VZV had switched on latent, quiescent, we're calling it, because it's like latent, but we can't claim it's exactly the same, but it's very similar. Uh, looks as if VZV was switching on HSV1, and we're very excited about that, and we want now to look at other viruses and perhaps bacteria to see whether uh, other things do that and also in, do that in other cell cultures. The reason is that um, what is very, very interesting is that 
um, via the sort of mechanism I've been talking about, is thought infections are known to confer a risk of Alzheimer's disease. And about 20 years ago, I and a colleague suggested that um, after a paper where somebody had shown the vaccination protects against vaccination against a whole variety of illnesses, protects against um, development of Alzheimer's, we suggested this could be that infections cause reactivation of HSV1 in brain and therefore damage, accumulation of damage. And vaccination by preventing those um, infections confers protection against. And this is one example of where um, we haven't looked at the vaccination, but um, we hope to do something on that line. But what we've shown is that an infection by something other than HSV1 reactivates latent HSV1. So that sort of basic mechanism we propose leads to Alzheimer's disease. So we're very excited about that, and we're just submitting that now. <laughs> um, I think that's probably all I can tell you at the moment. I mean, there are other studies going on, because I think another very interesting question is whether or not uh, any individual who has Alzheimer's disease is infected, say, just with HSV1 or with another microbe, let's call it B or C or D. And does that person have HSV1 alone or does it have HSV1 plus B or plus C or plus D or does it have all of these things? In other words, is this a joint effort or is there a difference between individuals? It probably is where, you know, what they have in brain and whether or not these things are actually acting as factors. They, they might be sitting there doing nothing. We don't know that. It's known that there are now that there are quite a lot of microorganisms in brain, but whether they're doing anything is a different matter. But I think we need to find out firstly what's there in brain from individual A to individual B. And, uh, and then see whether or not they're actually doing anything or whether they're just sitting there passively. So that's the other, I think, hopefully exciting study we're doing. 